I'm really interested in uh, how technological advancement can affect our uh, future from an ethical point of view. Um, when I first considered speaking to you today about uh, cryptocurrency and wealth inequality, I hesitated because I learned that your theme is play, and let's be honest, it's not exactly a playful subject. But after some thought, I realized that play is actually at the very heart of this discussion. Um, you can sort of think about uh, the economy as sort of like the energy of a society. If you want to bring an electric system out of stasis, you need to apply energy. It allows that system to do um, something outside of its natural state of rest. In other words, it allows that system to do what it's designed to do. And this is sort of what um, the economy does for our society. If you have a strong flow of currency, then society can do what it's designed to do really well. And if you decrease currency flow, then society is less productive. And this brings us to our first big question, which is, does currency flow put a society to work or allow a society to play? And in order to avoid any semantic arguments, uh, let's define our terms for the purposes of this talk, where play occurs when we do things that we want to do, which is the end of our actions. Uh, play is everything that um, is, is the reason or goal for what we're doing. And work occurs when we do things that we uh, need to do, which is the means to our end. In other words, work is uh, everything that we do in order to meet those goals. So um, getting back to our original question of whether uh, currency flow produce, produces work or play, the answer to this in our current society is a little complicated because we spend money not only on things that we want, but also on things that, uh, also on things that we need. So I'll give you an example. I spent a little bit of money to ride the subway to get here this morning, and I'll admit the New York subway can be pretty entertaining sometimes, which I guess could kind of make it an end in and of itself, but what I was really, the real reason why I did that was so that I could get here to talk to you today. So under our current definitions, I'm up here playing right now, and I use the subway as a means to do that. Now, I suppose I could have uh, saved a little bit of money by, um, I guess walking or even swimming all the way here from Astoria, but that would have been a, that would have been a lot of work. So instead, I decided to spend a little bit of money to put a bunch of machines and people who run those machines to work in lieu of doing the work myself. I was able to do that because people had paid me previously to do work that they didn't want to do. And onward goes this uh, cycle of the exchange of goods and services, uh, which creates currency flow. And we must ask ourselves, is this really what we want out of our society? When we put money into our economy, do we want it to produce work or to produce play? Perhaps a better question to ask is, how do we want to design our society? Now, I don't know about you, but I really like to play. And I like to play as much as I possibly can. And since we're all gathered here at a TED conference today themed play, I'm gonna make an assumption that you do too. But when we spend money on uh, things that we want, then there's less money to spend on things that we need. So um, I want to propose an alternative design to uh, our society, which emphasizes a play motivated, uh, which emphasizes play motivated exchange of goods and services by decreasing work motivated exchange goods and services as much as we possibly can. The key to this is uh, machines and automation. So this is no, no revolutionary idea. We've been doing this ever since our ancestors began using tools. Um, I can now perform immense calculations with a computer almost instantaneously, which would have taken uh, mathematicians hours to do just 100 years ago. We no longer really have need for the classic switchboard operators for our telephones, and no one really seems to mourn this. I know in the facade of things, the loss of jobs kind of seems to be a really bad idea, but this is really due to the way that we've designed our economy to fit into our society, because at the end of the day, we make the rules. We decide which jobs we want to automate and which jobs we want humans doing, and I'll give you a really good way to determine uh, which of those are which. So, I work in a hospital during the week, and I also um, play my trumpet for a, uh, community ensemble on the weekends. Now, if I won the lottery tomorrow, 
Which one of those things do you think I would devote more time to? If you guessed that I would play my trumpet, you'd be absolutely correct. And these are really the types of things that I would rather spend my money on and get paid to do. We want robots doing the types of jobs in which we expect a predictable, algorithmic, and reliable outcome. And we want humans doing the jobs of, well, humans. So if you work a rote job like me, then one should really not be asking if, but rather when, will a robot take my job, because this is the natural progression of things. We have become so inseparably adhered to this idea of how do I make my living, that it becomes irrelevant to ask instead, how can we as a society live better? Now, we've talked quite a bit about um, how to maximize the first part of this equation, so let's talk about the second, which is access. Um, and it turns out that we have a bit of a design flaw right now. Um, according to the Credit Suisse report, the top 1% of earners now own a r roughly 50.1% of the world's uh, wealth. Um, this is about a 5% increase over the past 15 years. And this is a pretty scary figure for about 99% of us because what we're left with, if, if we revisit our original question of whether uh, currency flow produces work or play, we're left with this really small percentage of people right here who keep getting more and more money from this huge percentage of people right here who are getting less and less money to spend on the things that they need. But believe it or not, I'm actually not here to fearmonger you today. But bear with me for just one moment uh, while I give you a little bit more news. I'm going to let you decide of whether it's scary or not. And it's this figure right here. This is a spike in Google search trends for the term fiat currency. Raise your hand if you know what fiat currency is. Yeah, not very many people. So fiat currency is uh, basically the agreed upon currency within a uh, population to facilitate its exchange of goods and services. So why this sudden interest right here around October of December of last year in the term fiat currency? What else spiked during this time last year? Bitcoin. So you might say that this is kind of an odd comparison to make, and correlation doesn't equal causation. I'm not going to try to argue that. But take a look at the related uh, Google search trends, um, which spiked around the same time as uh, cryptocurrency. Sorry, these uh, figures are really hard to read, but they're all um, in like 500, 400, 300 percentiles. Uh, Coinbase and um, Kraken, by the way, are cryptocurrency exchange platforms. So like I said, I'm going to leave it to you to make your own conjectures about why more and more people are pouring their money into cryptocurrency at a time when, um, when fiat currency is working for fewer and fewer people. Now, I'm going to use Bitcoin as an example to talk about um, several preconceived notions that you probably already have about cryptocurrency for no other reason than that Bitcoin is probably the coin that you're most familiar with. And um, for full disclosure, I own several different uh, types of crypto coins myself, including Bitcoin. I'm not going to try to pull a, a Sean Hannity on you all. Um, I'm also not going to try to pull a um, John McAfee either and pump any particular coin because um, Bitcoin, especially Bitcoin, because Bitcoin has a few issues uh, itself, which we're going to get to here in just a few minutes. But the first argument that my critic usually likes to make is that uh, Bitcoin is in a bubble. And um, a lot of people even want to say that that bubble has already burst. They've been saying that for around six years, by the way, as the bull and bear markets ebb and flow. And I'm not going to try to make any predictions about what Bitcoin is going to do, because um, I get it. It looks a whole lot like the historic um, stock bubbles, such as uh, Tulip Mania and um, the dot-com boom. But there's one glaring difference in uh, cryptocurrency that a lot of people tend to overlook when making this comparison, and that's that cryptocurrency is not a stock. It's not a commodity which will depreciate over time. 
it's not a public service which might lose its appeal in a few years. Intellectual property is probably a closer metaphor, but a dollar can never accurately represent value if it is perceived as being valuable itself. In fact, the real beauty of currency is that it doesn't exist corporeally, and it, um, it can never hold intrinsic value so long uh, unless it is one day ironically viewed as being an antique. So, as soon as we stop treating Bitcoin as a means to redistribute currency, or to redistribute wealth in another currency altogether, it can get back to doing its real job, which is to simply reliably record accountable exchange, which brings us to the next issue with Bitcoin, which is its spendability. And according to economic theory, um, a currency must uh, be relatively stable in value in order for it to be spendable. And this is what Bitcoin did just last month. So when you send a Bitcoin, it takes a little while for that coin to get where it's going, and during that amount of time, you will have inevitably lost or gained some value. And there's really no way to know what this thing is going to do from one moment to the next. So it's not exactly difficult to see uh, why a lot of vendors are a little hesitant right now to jump on the cryptocurrency bandwagon. Now, I know that um, Bitcoin has largely uh, gained the reputation for being a get-rich-quick scheme. And it can certainly do that for you if uh, you play your cards right and you get lucky. But I want to propose a different way of looking at it. Let's allow cryptocurrency to take its rightful place in technological history as automating the banking system. Because remember, through banking, we want a predictable, algorithmic, and reliable outcome. Let's take seriously, if not for just a moment, that for the first time in our recent history, we finally have a viable opportunity to rethink the world wealth distribution because wealth distribution is a natural byproduct of adopting cryptocurrency. But what is it doing for the wealth gap? So it turns out that wealth distribution in cryptocurrency is a little difficult to measure, uh, which is mainly due to the anonymous nature of its transactions. Um, it's almost impossible to know uh, who owns what and who paid who, but we do have irrefutable accounts of how much was spent and where it went. So what we can do is kind of analyze uh, what the distribution looks like within its concentration of groups, and it kind of looks something like this. Now, don't knock yourself out trying to analyze this graph too hard because it's pretty difficult to understand, but basically what it says is that the top four Bitcoin earners right now own roughly 96% uh, of the circulating Bitcoin. And I'll let you take a guess as to how much the top 1% owners earn. It's about half. And you know, to me, what the even worse news is, is that almost nobody is talking about this. In all my research on this issue, the most popular model that I was able to find for uh, visualizing the Bitcoin uh, wealth distribution is simply to mirror it exactly with the world fiat wealth distribution because we know that it looks so similar to that. So it begs the question, are we stuck? Is it simply human nature for us to create these huge wealth gaps? You know, I was watching a documentary not too long ago. It was about the 2016 presidential election and the interviewers go all over the nation uh, talking to Democrats, Republicans, everyone in between about their opinions and reactions to, um, to the election the day before, the day of, and the day after. And they interviewed a young black man. Uh, I believe it was, it was either here in New York City or in Chicago, I can't really remember which, but um, this particular young man didn't plan on voting. And they asked him, given the inevitable gravity of consequences that will come out of this election and the infamous struggle for uh, black suffrage in America, why would you not plan on voting? And this is what he said. He compares 
the American economy to a giant game of monopoly that rich white man had been playing for years. And he says that getting the right to vote got black people a seat at that table to play that game. But once they got there, the money from the bank had already been distributed. All the property on the board had already been bought up. And instead of trying to play this game that has had the odds stacked against him for decades, he said that the fair course of action would be to wipe the board and start over. Now, if Bitcoin were able to wipe that board, it has certainly done a lot to redistribute the wealth. But it has done very little for the wealth gap. So if you take one thing from me today, let it be this. And that's that if Bitcoin were to crash and burn tomorrow, let it be a multi-billion dollar lesson to us all that greed and wealth hoarding are endemic in populations whose economies are unchecked against it and favor its original participants. Now, I know I'm supposed to be up here talking to you about play, and instead I'm kind of just adding to your ever-growing list of things to worry about in the world. I don't need to tell you that there's a lot of scary things going on in the world right now. I don't need to tell you that Flint, Michigan still doesn't have clean drinking water. I don't need to tell you that Puerto Rico is still largely without power, that Venezuela is still largely without food, and that many Syrians still don't have homes. And now, I don't need to tell you that, at least in terms of wealth inequality, Bitcoin isn't looking too promising right now, but what I'm actually here to do today is to give you some hope. And that's that besides cryptocurrency, or besides Bitcoin, there are already hundreds, if not thousands, of crypto coins out there. And we have, we can program a coin to not only automate our transactions, but to emphasize exchanges of goods and services that humans actually want to be doing. We can program a coin that encourages spending and distribution instead of hoarding and gathering. And we can program a coin which places little emphasis on how long we've been participating in its economy. I know this idea might, might seem kind of lofty, and you may say that I'm a dreamer, but my idea worth spreading is that we have an opportunity to finally end one of the greatest injustices of our time, which is wealth inequality. We have an opportunity to finally end the Malthusian Darwinian idea of having to work as a means to justify our right to live. We have an opportunity to finally propel, propel ourselves from the survivalist economy to the prosperous economy. And we have an opportunity not only to maximize play, but to maximize access to play for more people than we ever have before. You know, transition is hard, but continuing along a trajectory which widens the gap between the rich and the poor and stifles our ability to play is also hard. And since we have a lot of hard decisions to make as a society in the near future, this is why I think that we should seize this genuine and unique opportunity. Because putting money into any cryptocurrency is not an investment. It's a vote. So vote on the future you want to live in. I really say all of that to say, let's get out and play. Thank you.